try and explain the uh, Panagurist, I'm trying, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, the Panagurist treasure found by two brothers in Bulgaria in 1949. Uh, you'd have to see it for yourself in order to understand that the value of this particular treasure is priceless. And uh, this is just one piece, all right, of, uh, of that treasure that was found. You just don't find stuff like this in your backyard, all right? Uh, but my point is this. Do you realize why there is such a long line at the Antique Roadshow? I don't know if you have, have, how many of you have ever seen the Antique Roadshow? Has, has anybody actually been to one? I've seen one at Navy Pier. I remember I was at Navy Pier in Chicago, and I remember... That, that I remember this huge line of people with these antiques and stuff. But uh, uh, the reason why there's such a long line at the antique roadshow is because they don't realize the value of something in their possession. So they get it appraised, right? You've got this woman who found this small mahogany uh, card table that she uh, found at a yard sale. 30 years prior to taking it to the roadshow. 30 years! I don't know how many of you remember this particular one, but she called it a moldy mess. But she was so taken by the style of it that she paid $25 after talking the seller down $5. There was a faded label on the other side of the table, which could still be faintly read, John Seymour and Sons of Boston. Uh, as it turns out, these were very distinguished cabinet makers in Boston who made some of the finest furniture for some of the wealthiest people in their time. Uh, that particular time uh, that the, the guy was talking about when they were, when they were um, uh, evaluating it was the 18th century. That's the, that's the 1700s. That's an old table. The original finish and craftsmanship was all intact, and Kino, one of the guys that's at the road show, um, he, was, uh, he stunned the lady when he appraised it for $250,000. That little table, I remember we had a little table sort of like that, and I'm wondering, you know, like, is that one of those, you know, we didn't even realize that it was. But, uh, right, right, it was, you know, it was kind of falling apart a little bit, but, uh, but at the Sotheby's auction, the table was actually $541,000. $541,000, excuse me. That's double what that guy had appraised it for. That's incredible. But just imagine with me for a moment, all right? Just imagine that that lady had that table for 30 years. 30 years. She had no idea the value of that table for 30 years. Stop and realize that the kingdom of heaven, which has been in your possession for some of you for a long time, is of greater value yes. than that table. Um, and that it's lying in the midst of a poverty-stricken, bankrupt, accursed world. That old table's gonna burn up one day. But not the kingdom of heaven. The abundant life of Christ, the indwelling life of Christ. While that table rises in value the older that it gets, the Christ life rises in value each time it is renewed within our minds. See? Um, here's the second lesson that we gather from these parables about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not superficially visible. All right? My wife likes to use the word superficial. Well, what in the world does that mean, Pastor? And you're like, that's a big word. Another big word, Pastor. You know, it's not as bad as epistemology, but that's a big one. <laughs> All right. But uh, this means that it wasn't just something that made a distinction of value. Consider the samurai sword, okay? Yeah, there you go. You can pull that up. Um, you're not going to find this just sitting somewhere. A strong, durable sword that's made for hard battle made by artists of the samurai, it's going to cost you about $10,000 to $20,000 to find one like this. This is what you might find, though. <laughs> All right? Just this big lump of metal. All right? Um, 
it's, it's, it's possible that you might have even found something like this before if you've ever been to Japan or in those areas. Uh, you just didn't know what it was, but it's called tamahakane. That's actually what the Japanese call that metal. It's a special metal found in Japan, and it's what makes perhaps the strongest, most durable sword in the world. It's just a, amazing the power that the samurai sword has. The curve in the samurai sword actually comes from being tempered with water. When it's heated up, the, the artist of the samurai sword takes it out of the fire at just the right time, and he puts that sword into the water, and when it does, it becomes so hard that it bends. That's why you have that, that curve shape in the samurai sword. It's not just... You know, it's, it's actually coming from being placed in the water at just the right time. It's very powerful. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, an amazing, uh, it's an amazing piece of metal. Um, it's just not manipulated by man, that particular piece of metal, right? Uh, that's kind of like us, you know, when it comes to God doing a work on us. If you, if you watch a video, there's actually an hour-long video about how to make a samurai sword. He takes that metal and he beats it, folds it, beats it down, folds it again, beats it down, folds it again, and you wonder when he's going to stop. And sometimes that's the Lord with us. But uh, it's like that tamahagane. You just have to look for it. You're not going to find a sword, but you will find that particular metal. And they'll pay good money for it. But you have to know where, and you have to know how, and if you want to find something bad enough, you're going to do the research to find it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, and I want to begin at verse 13. All right, will you do that with me? All right, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Enter ye in. All right, I'm going to give you a chance here. So Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Oh, we were in Matthew 13, by the way. It's just This is just a summary. You don't have to necessarily turn. Actually, I would like for you to turn to Matthew 13 in a minute here, but, um, but for right now, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, turn with me to Matthew 7. All right, let's look at it. Enter ye in at the straight gate, verse 13, at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Okay, so now I want you to look carefully at those two verses. Do you see anywhere in those two verses that suggests that the straight and narrow way is hard to find? All right, now, now just think about that, all right? The, the fact is, is that you really don't find anywhere that says that it's hard to find. It says few there be that find it, but it never said straight is the gate that's hard to find. It never said that, all right? I don't really see it. I like good old Yogi Berra. He said some of the funniest things. He made some of the funniest quotes. Here's one of them. If you don't know where you are, if you don't know where you are going, you might wind up someplace else. <laughs> well, thanks, Yogi. I appreciate that, all right? Um, I don't know if Yogi Berra said this, but this sounds like something that he'd say. If you don't know what you're looking for, you might not find it. You know, that really applies to the straight gate, the narrow way. Um, makes enough sense, but what, well, what am I trying to say, all right? If you're not finding what you need, you might be spending too much time looking for what you want. All right, now that was my quote. That was Mike Barnett's quote. So when I die, you can put that down in a quote book. All right, I'm just kidding. All right, but... Uh, but Seriously, are, are, are people really looking for the straight and narrow way? No. No, they're too occupied. They're too busy trying to go where everybody else is going. All right, I'm a Trekkie fan. Spock said this, humans make illogical decisions. It's very true. They really do, all right? They make illogical decisions. Try a little experiment sometime, all right? Go into a child's room with the child. Sit there with that child. Right, moms, you know about this. Dads, you know about this. All right, sit with that child for a little bit and watch, watch which toy that kid doesn't play with. 
like just something you know for sure. Wait for about four to five minutes and make sure that that particular toy is not going to be touched by a kid. All right. Um, you know, uh, just wait, wait for just a little bit. Make sure that that's the one. Then pick up that toy yourself and start playing with it. And I want you to watch what happens. Does anybody know what's going to happen? No. <laughs> the child, yeah, yeah. Right? That child's going to come up and want your toy. The very moment that you pick up the toy that that kid had no interest in whatsoever, as soon as you pick an adult, I've seen him do this with adults, as soon as you pick up that toy and start playing with it, that little kid's going to come up and want to take it from you. That's fine. I mean, they will come to you and pull it out of your hand. Why? Because it's covetousness. It's something that's ingrained in our nature. And that's why people aren't finding the way that leads to life. It's because they see what everyone else is going for. All right? No. You've got to look for it. You look for it and you'll find it. Um, but it's not going to have a distinctive look that says, Hey, over here, I'm the answer. You have to look. Or you won't find it. Now here's number three. The kingdom of heaven... The spirit-filled life, the abundant life of Christ is personally, personally appropriated. All right, now I'm going to explain what that means. All right, every time we study um, a, a parable on the kingdom of heaven, it was always one individual. All right, so now you can turn to Matthew chapter 13. All right, so you were in Matthew chapter 7, so now look at Matthew 13. I want to show you what I'm talking about as far as individual appropriation, all right? Let's start with verse 24 of Matthew chapter 13. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. A man, an individual. All right, now look at verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. There again, individuality, not plurality. All right. Uh, look at verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took. Individual. All right, now look at verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. And finally, verse, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. A man, right? Just an individual, all right? These people felt like because they were a part of the nation of Israel that they were by default a part of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And uh, you might go to New Grace Baptist Church, the only best church there is in Tarver, all right? <laughs> You might go there, but that doesn't mean that you found the abundant life. You might be faithful to church. You might be close to the pastor. But that doesn't mean that you found the indwelling life of Christ. All right? It is our individual responsibility. I can show you. I can teach you. I can do it with as many uh, amazing, funny, stupid silly illustrations that I can on the screen. I put on some pretty funny illustrations to try and help you to understand some things, all right? But Matthew 13, 9 says, who has ears to hear? Let him hear. It's individual appropriation. All right, number four. The kingdom of heaven is the true source of real joy. All right, the kingdom of heaven is the true source of real joy, all right? Look at verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth and, what does it say? For joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Do you see the emphasis on joy? All right? Uh, Jesus is acknowledging the basic longing of the human being. Every human being, they want to be happy. Really, I want to be happy. Do you want to be? You want to be happy? How many of you want to be miserable? You know, when I was a when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I used to listen to some of the weirdest stuff. And there was this song called "I'm Only Happy When It Rains." I'm like, yeah, right. But, and it was all it was talking about how they're happy only when they're depressed. How silly! What a ridiculous 
What a ridiculous statement, all right? But, uh, but, that, but the, the, the desire for every human being is to be happy, all right? Uh, you know, I mentioned the straight and narrow way that leads to life as opposed to the wide and broad way that leads to destruction. Why is it that the broad way which leads to destruction is busting at the entrance with people trying to get in? I remember that we were, uh, we were at SeaWorld and my niece and I rode one roller coaster called the Manta, all right? You want to pull it up? Yeah, there it is, the Manta. We rode that thing about five times. I mean, that thing was awesome. We loved it uh, because the line was nothing in comparison to other lines, all right? There's other roller coasters that came in. All right, you can pull that one up now. Yeah, there we go. And uh, I, I, I'm, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was one of those up-down, up-down roller coasters. I mean, it made everybody who got on it sick. Um, you know, we didn't really like that too much, and so we, we got in a long line, and we got on it, and we, you know, it, 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 it wasn't very exciting, but it's no longer there, because a lot of people didn't like it. The Manta is still there, all right? Uh, you know, we actually, like I said, we wrote it once, but we really didn't care to write it again. In fact, there were people who were waiting in line, and people were walking by saying, don't wait in line, it's not worth it. But they still waited in line anyway, because everybody else was doing it, all right? Um, uh, there's another one called the Mako. It didn't last, there, last very long either. So what gives? It's because everybody saw the lines and they assumed that it was fun, all right? Um, they had to try the new thing that everyone else was trying. So with this in mind, it looks amusing to everyone else, therefore it must be amusing, when in fact, Everyone else is making the same false assumption. So while you think everybody else wants to do this, they're all making the same false assumption too. They see you in line and want it. So they're making a false assumption, but you're never going to hear about that. The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure that causes a man to sell everything he had with joy over what he had found. Just like that worthless coaster that, I, that, that, that we got on, it was just, you know, it was, it was no good, which did nothing but make you sick. People are stubbornly attending churches that are coveted, that, that, are, that, are, that are covered, that are covering the treasures of heaven instead of discovering the joy of the Lord. And I'm not trying to, I'm not dissing on churches here. I'm not trying to say that my church is better than yours and all that stuff. It, it is better. It is better, but, but I'm not saying that right now, okay? What I'm saying is, is that people are stubbornly going in one direction uh, because everybody knows the pastor, because the church is the most popular one in town. It's got to be the only place that can possibly be helpful. That's how it is. It's got these certain types of, you know, it's got the, it's got the mist maker, whatever it is that you call it, you know. It's got just the kind of music that I like. It's the lax approach, all right? That's what John McGeldern calls it. And, you know, it seems to be fun for a little while, but it's never satisfying. So you got one extreme. You've got people who are legalistic. They follow all these rules, these rigid rules. And then you've got other churches that have no rules at all. And neither one of them are going to satisfy. It's only the liberating life of Jesus that's going to satisfy. But because everybody knows the pastor, because it's the most popular one, because it's advertised so hugely, people are going to go. But, you know, it's got to be the only place that can possibly help. I like to call our little church Tarboro's Best Kept Secret. As a matter of fact, it says that on the back of our uh, van. It says, uh, it says, follow me to Tarboro's Best Kept Secret. All right? It's the greatest place to be in all of Tarboro, but very few find it. All right? Is it hard for them to look? No. Don't listen to people who say, I couldn't find your church. They didn't look hard enough. They can find it if they want to find it. You all found it, all right? Because you were determined enough to be here, all right? So, oh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you know, some of the, some of the issues is, is prejudice, we're a white church in the middle of a black neighborhood. And unfortunately, because of that, there's a lot of prejudice. Oh, it's in that kind of a neighborhood. 
And I'm not trying to say that, I'm not, I'm not saying that I have a problem with that. What I'm saying is, is that people generally have a prejudice. That's just how it's going to be. And so because we're a predominantly white church, we've got black people that come to this church, but because we're predominantly white, but we're in the wrong neighborhood, people are going to go, oh, well, that's a nice church, but I just don't like the location. It's a terrible thought. It's a terrible misconception about our church. Personally, I think we're in a pretty good neighborhood. Our neighbors have been good to us. There's not been any, you know, I, I, I've gone down, they've, you know, there's been times where they've had little parties and I've said, would you mind turning the music down uh, till after we're done? And they were, they gladly obliged to do it. This is not a bad neighborhood. But unfortunately, there's a lot of prejudice that goes on. And uh, so, you know, but here's the thing. It didn't stop the rich, probably the richest woman in Tarboro from attending this place for a while. She was dying of cancer. Was she a little bit funny about the location? Sure, she was a little bit. But you know what? She still wanted to find what brought her joy. I'm not going to name her name because I love her family too much. Some of you remember her. But she found joy, and she died joyful. She had lived a life of sin, a life of misery, a life of woe, and she found Jesus, and she died happy. Because she looked, and she found and she uncovered riches. She was suffering, sure, but she found joy, and she found new grace to die. Joy is a good thing. John 15, 11 says it like this. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. John 4, uh, 16, 24 puts it this way. Hitherto have ye asked me nothing. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. 1 John 1, 4 says, And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Don't let that mental, mental filter of yours mess you up with that one, all right? Look at that verse again. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Did you see that? It's nothing that deals with the eyes. It's not about what you see. It's not about what you eat. It's not meat and drink. It's not any kind of pleasure that the rest of the world is seeking for. Look at what brings joy, all right? It's something that to our natural observation gets fatigued over. Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What a strange combination. Peace and joy I can get. Just like those disciples thought that they got the kingdom of heaven, but you have to understand, righteousness is in the same category as joy and peace. It fits together. But the key is at the very end of that verse, the Holy Ghost. That's the key. Righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through, what does it say? The power of the Holy Ghost. All right, there it is. Oh, power. And, and when you found it, you can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. All right? Oh, it's a sure investment. Then number five, not everyone comes to discover the kingdom of God in the exact same way. Boy, we often expect people to find the kingdom of God the same way a lot of times, don't we? But that doesn't happen. Not everyone comes to discover the kingdom of God in the exact same way. There are four things in the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl that are the same. Each parable has an individual person. Okay? All right, an individual person. Each discovers something of great value. Each comes to understand the worth of it, and each is willing to give up everything for that treasure. That's all the same. But in each instance, the discoveries are different. All right, they're different. Um, you know, I, I don't know how, you know, some of you uh, can tell me your testimony of how you came to know Jesus, and they're all going to be different. Just as much as we all have different gifts and abilities in our life, all right, uh, I, I love it that we've got an, a, a biologist. I think that's just so cool. I used to love biology. But, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a biologist in our midst. We've got teachers in our midst. We've got nurses in our midst, firemen in our midst. We've got carpenters. We've got, we've, we've got care, uh, uh, um, 
Oh, what, what do you call those things? See, my brain's going blank. But anyway, we've got all different types of gifts, okay, inside of this church. But in the very same way, we came to know Jesus Christ differently, okay? Um, so don't expect everybody to find Jesus in the exact same way that you did. You can expect it to be an individual. You can expect it to find. You can expect them to same the uh, find the same truth that you did. You can expect them to come to understand the value of it, and to even be willing to sell everything that they have for it. Barnabas did that, didn't he? He sold his land for the kingdom of heaven. Um, but you cannot expect that to all happen the same way that it happened to you. All right. Every story is different. For some, they were in search of it. To others, God is gracious enough to let them stumble over it. It's all based on the one who holds the pen to all of our stories. I mean, you look at Judas. Consider Judas and consider the thief on the cross. I mean, Judas walked with God. Judas baptized. Judas cast out the devils by the power of the Lord. He did all of these things. Yet he kissed the door and went to hell at the end of his life. But then you've got this man at the end of his life, after he, even I, I dare say maybe even after he uh, cast the same thing that the soldiers cast into Jesus' teeth, eventually came to a place where he began to realize who Jesus was as he watched him. And suddenly he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into, my, into thy kingdom. And he saved at the very end of his life a wicked life. He was hanging on the cross because he's what you call a highwayman, which is somebody who robs people while they're, while they're on the way somewhere and uh, might have likely even killed somebody because of it. But yet this one man, living a life of wickedness, goes to heaven. It's a big difference, all right? It's all about faith, but things happen in different ways. All right, well, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll... Uh, I, I, before we do pray, do, do you have any prayer requests um, that I can write down? And I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for watching this broadcast. If you have any questions about the message or would like to chat in any way, we would love to connect with you. You can message us on Messenger, and we will get you in touch with the right people. I also want to invite you to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ personally, to make Jesus your own personal Savior. Friend, if this message has helped you understand the gospel, that you cannot earn your way to heaven, that there is no way to achieve your salvation, if you've understood today that salvation is a gift from God, and all you can do is receive it by faith, then why don't you act on the promise of God? Why don't you claim the truth that Jesus Christ himself said that whosoever would believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wherever you may be right now, I hope that you will bow your head and heart before God and place your faith in Jesus Christ. Tell him that you want him to be your personal savior. He will come into your life. He'll be a savior, a father, and a faithful friend. and He'll change you beginning today. To find out more about this decision, I encourage you to message us or go to the link below me, bit.ly slash pandemic323 to learn more. And I want to thank you again so much for taking part in this broadcast, and I hope to see you next time.